everyone. Uh, hello. That was a really nice intro. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, yes, so my name is Jackie Oakley. I'm an illustrator. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about style, which is something, as an illustrator, you come across all the time. And it's sort of a dirty word in a way, because everyone's obsessed with it, but no one wants to admit that they're trying to find a one certain style that's going to make them tons of money and make them really famous. But what I'm trying to talk to you about today is trying to make a style that feels really personal and genuine to you and not just some fad. So I teach also, I've been an illustrator for about 10 years and I've still struggled over this idea of what I want my work to look like and it's constantly changing. And then students also come to me always wondering about, well, I've got one more year left of school, how am I going to find a style so I can actually make money out there? Because it's a really tricky world. So what you want to do is to try and um, have something that looks really unique so clients will come to you for something that no one else can do because obviously there's like tons of talented people out here. And you want to make sure that this look means something to you and it's something that you want to grow with. You're not going to get bored with. Because even if you're drawing for a living, which sounds really awesome if you have some other job, it's still something that you do every single day so we can kind of get a little bit monotonous after a while. So you want to have something that can ignite that flame. So I try to think about it broken up in a few different ways, thinking about your past, your influences, how you think, and even how you hold a pencil. So the people who don't work with pencils, um, computers or whatnot. So where you come from. And I had an artist friend who once asked me what kind of artwork hung up in the walls of my house when I was a kid, and what um, art my parents bought, or what furniture was around, and whether these things actually influenced my work as an adult. And I never really thought about it before. But then I got to thinking, my parents picked up all sorts of weird, random crap and travels, and we had um, tons of different things in our house. And I, there were certain things that I would stare at a lot, and I think they did shape me quite a bit. This is me, a uh, three-year-old in Africa, um, very happy. <laughs> And I swear that my hairstyle has changed between here and there. It has got like longer and shorter over the years, but um, this works for me, so what can I do? So yeah, like Joseph says, I've traveled around a lot. I was really lucky to have that as a kid. Um, I actually live in Hamilton, Canada. I don't know if there's any other Canadians around. There's like one person back there who knows me. <laughs> I'll take it. So yeah, Hamilton, Canada, which is right next to Toronto. It's really close to there. And I actually teach at the university in Toronto called OCAD. But when I was a kid, I was born there. And then very, very quickly, we moved to Libya, Zambia, and Bahrain in the Middle East, where I spent most of my childhood. And then in between, we traveled back and forth to England all the time. So I have this really messed up accent that no one quite knows how to place. And for some reason, all my English relatives, I don't think they've ever met an American before, because they think I sound like a yank. <laughs> They're just like, you sound like such a yank. I'm like, I don't think you know what that means. <laughs> So we're lucky, too, to travel and go on lots of trips and go to uh, China and the Mediterranean, different things like that. So these are all the objects that were in the house. We were lucky to have a lot of really beautiful Persian rugs from the Middle East. And especially those I would stare at and try and figure out all these intricate patterns. They really mesmerized me. We also had a lot of Chinese brushwork and mosaics, uh, textiles from Africa, batiks, a lot of really crazy masks that I would love, but they would also really scare me at the same time. So all of these um, kind of combined, I think, to be things that I love that I keep trying to find about how to interject into my own artwork. And for you, it might be something totally different. It could be uh, comic books or album covers. And uh, an example of one of my pieces where I kind of can see a lot, of, a lot of the ornate patterns coming in. 
but also this kind of love of this fantastical world as being like a little kid and growing up in this desert country where there was a tiny, tiny population then traveling to a place like Hong Kong and being totally overwhelmed with these buildings and skyscrapers um, reminds me of kind of pieces like this. So I was really lucky to get a job where I got to kind of experiment with a lot of the travels that I had when I was a kid. And it was called Lighting Our Worlds. And it was all about festivals, of fireworks, and big bonfires all over. Um, one of these was this really amazing one that uh, is actually in the Shetland Islands in England which is kind of way up there, isolated. And each year, they I have no clue how they do this, but they pick one lucky guy to be the Viking king. I don't know how you get that job, but it sounds amazing. And then throughout the year, they build a huge life-size Viking galley ship. And then at this festival, they actually burn it and dance around it. So it just sounds really insane and amazing. So I think we all should go. Maybe we should have WMC Fest there next year. Yes. Or think about a galley. So um, to me, England was really exotic. I grew up in a desert. There was lots of camels and geckos and the odd random dirty goat that would pass by. Um, but when I went to England, I thought the animals there were super, super exotic, like this guy. <laughs> Um, I don't think you understand, there's like rodents all around, running around, and no one seems to notice, and it's really crazy when you're not used to it. So that and chipmunks, chipmunks are really crazy too. So I would be obsessed with this, and then I would just fill up my sketchbooks, drawing all these kind of country animals that I saw in England because I found them really fascinating and different. And I was lucky to be able to bring this back in my own work. So one of my paintings, I got on a tangent once where I got fairly good at drawing birds, and then for a while, I feel like every single illustration job I got was of a bird, which is really great, but after a while, I'm like, I can do more than birds, come on. Um, but what's really fun about these kind of things, just like those influences I was talking before, I really love the, love the intricacies of feathers and texture, textures of different animals and the color too. And breaking that down, I find really fun. And also trying to add like a little bit of charm or wit in their faces, and a little bit of personality. So sometimes Picasso got it right. Sometimes he's kind of full of it, but sometimes he got it right. And uh, here's a great quote from him about this subject. So, yeah, what we're just talking about here is trying to remember that excitement that you had about something when you were a kid. And for you, it could be whatever. It could be cartoons or whatnot, or what, that certain thing that you just stared at in your parents' house that you really loved. And when you're doing work, you don't have to do something that looks exactly like that, but just remember that kind of thrill that you got from it and trying to bring, interject that into your work occasionally. Sometimes you can't always do it, but try and bring that back into there. And think about squirrels sometimes and how weird they are. So your visual interests. So hopefully, since your childhood, your interests have continued to grow and change and get larger. So in the illustration classes I teach too, I always find that students tend to just like a piece. Like, what do you think about this? Oh, I really like it. So great, I like it. <laughs> so really think about uh, trying to get them to break down. Like, what is it about that piece of art or design that really makes you gravitate towards it? And it could be something like just the color or the combination of line work or a contrast between two elements. So when you're inspired by something, you don't take the whole thing, but you think about its component parts, and then you can make those parts more um, integrated into your own work. It'll become more personal to you, and not just a straight copy, which a lot of people complain about in our community online. So a few of my influences, um, Again, loving color and intricacies, but really loving graphic design and old vinyl record covers too, and old cartoons like Windsor McKay and Mobius and things like that that my work doesn't necessarily look like 
and um, I don't always have time to draw huge, crazy skulls, but there's something about the line work that I can bring back into my just regular editorial illustration work. Um, sometimes with inspirations too, you can get really overwhelmed by them, they're really exciting, but if you're doing work, it's nice to kind of look at them to ignite a flame and then put them away, because if you're staring at them the whole time as you're doing your own work, you're just gonna be comparing yourself all the time, and that can only end in tears. So look around you, and look outside your own field of inspiration, which is a lot that's coming up today, right, with Alonzo and Adam. So think about different um, film, design, architecture, anything that strikes your fancy. If you're an illustrator, don't just look at illustrators, same for designers, and that will make your work more unique and open you up to new and interesting things, obviously, too. So a few kind of different things that I like, films, um, typography, uh, graphic design, science fiction, arts, um, Japanese textiles, and trying to, again, break it down to the component parts and thinking what I actually like about this. I'm not gonna probably make a film anytime soon, but when I look at these film stills, is it the color that I really like about it? Is it the mood, is it the composition and the way the figures are offset? And how maybe I can bring that element into the next illustration I might be able to do. Um, things that you just see around you in the world too, like peeling paint and, and signs like that too, are also quite inspiring. So uh, this case in point of what I'm talking about, this is a bunch of inspirations I did for a job. I got an art director calling me, asking me to do an in-flight magazine illustration about the heydays of Acapulco in the 1940s and how all the actors went there just to hang out and party with each other and how it was quite a hot spot, which sounded like an awesome illustration to do. So just looking at kind of weird, um, textile patterns, because I want to do some kind of flowers and color and lettering and hand-painted Mexican signs, which are really beautiful, but have this nice imperfection about them, which I really like in illustration work, too. And bringing that all together and making it my own. I also like this lady and how wonky her nose is, too. So this is the final piece in the end. It's painted uh, in acrylic. And I went for that kind of vintage postcard feel. And then added some of the inspiration from those flower textiles and the peeling kind of paint idea and that kind of worn idea. So doing this has led me to do more work that's kind of similar in the same vein, which is exciting that it kind of opened the door for that. And some of my process work too, there for you to see. So Francis Bacon, some of you might know, um, an interesting quote from him, even though most of the time he was angry and drunk, um, sometimes he actually had interesting, interesting things to say. So um, being inspired a lot by graphic design too, and I don't design, obviously I illustrate, um, but sometimes you have jobs, well, most of the time you have jobs as an illustrator where they might be really dry subject matter, and a lot of them are for business magazines where you have to do an illustration about stock prices rising. You're like, Ugh, how am I gonna do this? Um, so trying to look at other kind of sources, and these are these beautiful vintage fortune covers, uh, Jerome Schneider and Neil Fujita, and they just had this really beautiful, interesting way about dividing up buildings into segments and doing something kind of abstracted with it and a really great uh, color palette. And I have no clue why business magazines don't look like this now. Like everyone should try and like email them and go, what were you doing back then? Why are you doing it still now? Because um, they're really, really beautiful. So the job for this was about alumni magazine, graduates going to smaller law firms instead of really big business law firms, which is really dry. I did not want to draw a bunch of lawyers. So taking this kind of inspiration, um, that was my final illustration. So you can see it incorporates some of those elements from those really talented guys. Gave me like a different kind of color palette to work with and jump off from that I wouldn't normally have done. Um, but at the end of the day, it has kind of my detail and um, the way I would draw trees added to it, some realistic forms. So it's kind of a combination of those two. 
And now, now I have something different that I can add to my suitcase of tools that I can bring back into my work, which is really great. This is for a job uh, from a Niagara winery, because um, we do have wine in Canada, I swear. Some of it's pretty good. And it was to do a canister um, for this wine that was coming out at Christmas time. In Canada, we have like national liquor stores. We don't, can't get uh, uh, liquor from just regular corner shops. So it was nice that you could have got to see it in these like big fancy shops, which is great. And it was about, Cuvée Catherine, who was the great, great, great grandmother of the, the wine family. And no one actually had any photos of her, so I kind of make her up. So I decided, why don't I make her into a sexy water nymph? And somehow they were okay with it. <laughs> I don't know how, how I got that past, but I did. So looking at things I was really excited about, I started with like that Japanese textile pattern from kimonos at the top left. I really love this kind of flow to it. And then looking at Art Deco and Art Nouveau images. And then um, I always like to try and throw in some psychedelic science fiction subjects in there, <laughs> try and stick it in there. So um, that was really great, fun to work on. And then this is the final result. So again, a combination of all those things, but making something in the end that feels like truly your own, hopefully. Um, Kind of the only thing about this was that I did all these stripes and they matched up beautifully in the drawing, but then as I painted, um, they went different thicknesses slightly and it actually had to match when it came around the cylinder, so I had to keep like fidgeting with it at the end. So don't use stripes that have to match around a circular uh, cylinder. It was not fun whatsoever. So the next piece of the puzzle is how you think and you as an individual, because everyone think about visuals all the time, but they never actually think about your processes of how you would break things down. Um, sometimes when you start out a career, it's hard to know how you would approach a problem. You've got so much on your chest thinking about even what media you want to use, what kind of visuals you want to use, and everyone has a different problem solving style and sense of humor, and you've got to try and work with what you've got and try and not be overwhelmed by all the other amazing people out there because there's obviously tons and tons of talent and they probably want to do something closer to what you want to do. So this called for humor. This is everyone's friend Bill O'Reilly uh, for the Progressive Magazine. And this is about the two books that he wrote, uh, <laughs> called, <laughs> supposedly wrote, um, called Killing Lincoln and Killing Kennedy. And he kind of exaggerated a lot of it, made it a little bit more dramatic, I think. So I had him as a kid just kind of doodling and making stuff up as he went along. Um, it's also kind of fun to do like this little cocky smirk that he has and get that in there. So that was good. I didn't get any angry letters from him, so that was nice. So creative work not only requires a vocabulary of imagery, but also a stock of ideas and approaches. You want to make sure you have metaphors and symbols and puns and any other means that you can develop visual solutions alongside your arsenal of imagery and techniques and media. And uh, just don't forget that and keep working on those skills all the time. So these methods should also be born from your experience and they should be personal to you, just like the visual work. This is a job where I had to work with a really tricky subject matter called um, about female mutilation. So obviously it was really hard subject to do in visuals and get it printed in a magazine and make sure it was okay for people, but still to make it powerful and not um, put down the, the importance of the subject. So I started off doodling a bunch of ideas about um, women and vulnerability and sex and confinement and came up with these, these different symbols that I combined together and then tried to have some kind of strong emotion and atmosphere because I know that is something that I can do okay. So combining something new with something that I'm feeling fairly confident with. So you now examined your past, your visual influences and how you think and you have to put it in action. So recognize what you're good at, reinforce those advantages, and determine areas where you can grow and improve. So you have to uh, 
make those differences work from you. And remember that we all hold a pen differently. We're all going to draw differently. And that happens with everything. So Milton Glaser, a hero both in design and illustration, and also a really wonderful teacher too. Um, anytime you hear him speak, he just has like fountains of knowledge. But what I love about him too is that he's really open about his vulnerability and that he actually has a hard time with process just like any of us, which you don't always hear from really big names, which is quite wonderful. And that he's always trying to work on new things and new directions. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So the key here is to think about you, what you can control or master. So a few things have come together for me in a few years, and um, just different kind of concepts and tools. One was working with kind of stencils of color and building up from it. What I used to do in the past was do these intricate drawings all in ink by hand, and then I'd fill it in, and it felt like I was just coloring in a coloring book, and it got really boring after a while. Doing this kind of method, I just layered layers and layers and layers of color and then did ink work on top. And it ended up being really interesting because it was kind of happy accidents that would happen with it that I hadn't uh, figured out that was going to happen and led me to different kind of directions. Sometimes those accidents are really bad, but then you just hide those projects. So um, focusing on the good ones, uh, this was really exciting. And then it turned out like this. And what was really great about this project, too, was that it ended up being on an album cover, and I got to work with my husband, Jamie, who's in the back corner, I think, there, um, on it. So he, he was doing the design work, I was doing the illustration, and that was really fun to collaborate together. So this kind of um, media, use of media, came into other projects. This is Elvis everyone's favorite king, and I did the same thing, just kind of starting stenciling out colors and layering them on top of each other. And this is about his last days when um, he was not in very good shape. He was a little bit chubby, a little bit sick, a little bit sad, so I wanted to make sure that comes around. And so he wasn't super recognizable, and if I had just drawn like the older Elvis, no one would really recognize it as the king. So I had to kind of look at a lot of the younger pictures and combine them together to make sure uh, that it still looks like him, which is a tricky thing to do. And kind of like halfway through it, he started to look like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like, I didn't notice it. JB came in one day, he's like, your guy kind of looks like a Bollywood star. <laughs> I'm like, crap. <laughs> It's because he's got like really lovely eyelashes and long black hair. Um, so I think I brought it back from it and he started to look more like Elvis, which is good because I don't think the book publisher would be thrilled with that. So even when I was adding this new technique, I was still working with ideas that I already felt comfortable with. So with color and paintings and line work, it was just kind of the order of things. So I was adding something new to the mix, but still relying on things that I felt confident about. I'm doing small steps into new territory. This is a cover where I started doing um, ink work and then I added the color digitally after the fact. So that was a bit different too. And uh, it was really fun to work on because they came to me and said, well, we want a cover. I'm like, magazine cover, that's awesome. Okay, I'm there. Magazine cover, and then they wanted to have it influenced by the old Vintage Farmers Almanac magazine covers, which are beautiful and ornate. So that was great too. And then they said, add old radios and lawnmowers and hummingbirds, and then add a whole ton of gnomes. I'm like, yes, I will add gnomes for you everywhere. So that was really awesome and super fun. So I can't really take credit for the idea, but yeah, there you go. So there's a little bit of the process, inking it all by hand, and, and then adding the color digitally afterwards. So a little bit different, but fun nonetheless. But my hand hurt so much after that. Now the project done, it's a similar kind of way, inking. This was done for Amazon. They did a set of books. And one was a big Sherlock box set, and the other was Jane Austen box set. And there was actually 132 illustrations that I did in 12 weeks, 
which was, <laughs> I know, I can't believe it myself. How am I still here? Um, <laughs> there was like, I think I had like, every four days I would have a nervous breakdown. I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then I, and then I got back to it. So um, somehow I managed to get it done, but because it was such a crazy deadline, I had to work in a way more simplified, stripped down manner than I normally did. I couldn't really rely on color or, or big lion heads to get by. <laughs> so um, instead, I just had to rely on doing all these action scenes instead and doing like big shots of big pulpy color in the background, which is great. What was nice too, um, in contrast to all those bird illustrations I was doing, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to do all these Victorian gentlemen struggling and choking each other, which is <laughs> so fun. And then in order to do this, I actually had to get my friends to pose in all these compromising positions for my reference photos. So now I have on my computer all these blackmail photos. So <laughs> yeah, it was really good. So uh, what we're talking about here is keeping yourself excited and inspired, but it's not all about what you want to do and just about your experience. You're also working with a client, and the client is working for a bigger audience that they're representing. So you, the challenge, but sometimes the fascinating aspect of our jobs is to align these two aspects and to manage to work with both. And sometimes those boundaries actually push our work in different directions too. So you want to make sure you bridge the gap between your own personal um, experience that you're going through here and those of an audience. These are the Jane Austen books I did that went alongside the Sherlock ones. Um, so these were very different than The Choking Gentleman. There was a lot of fields and a lot of flowers and a lot of big stately homes. So to make it different, I had to kind of work with different objects and flowers and whatnot to make each of the compositions a bit unique. And the tricky thing with this, for some reason the client didn't want any faces in them, and for, for these there were 70 illustrations with no faces and characters in nearly every single one. So luckily there was a lot of bonnets back then. So it's like bonnet to the back. Um, so that worked out fine at the end. I was really confused for a while, but I managed to make it work. These are Anna Green Gables books that are coming out next year, and there's actually a series if you know her work. She's a big Canadian author, and it was her growing up over six books, so I had to make her age, which is really tricky, because I'm not used to doing the same character more than once at all. And in order to get the right direction, we had to go through a lot of process work. Even just to figure out what a client wants, it takes a lot of communication back and forth, and you might not use the same kind of vocabulary to, to even express what you want. So at the end, we got there, um, but there were a lot of roughs, endless, endless roughs. So it's not always easy to get to the final um, product, but I always tend to like to see from other illustrators that it is a process that you have to go through. So the boundaries on the projects that led to more growth and kind of forced me to do things I was a bit scared of myself, but actually worked out in the end. It's about this time. So this can apply to any creative field. A little bit Sabbath. I thought I'd wake you guys up if you got bored. Sorry. <laughs> so if you look at different artists like Black Sabbath, you can break it down the same four ways you've been talking about. Thinking about their background, they're from Birmingham, UK, and it was a very industrial working class city back then. And they're working in very gritty kind of pubs and bars. So that really influenced the sound of their music and where they were coming from. There's also their influences as Yardbirds and Cream and the Kinks and other bands that were getting heavier at the time, but not as heavy as Black Sabbath got. Uh, then there were also horror movies, like the movie Black Sabbath, which is actually pretty awesome if you haven't seen it, by Mario Bava. And that really, really stuck with them, obviously, so they named themselves after it. Then there was How You Think, and there was, I think, a few drug-induced horror visions thrown in there that kind of influenced the sound of the band. 
And then working with what you've got, and you can think about things like uh, Tony Iommi. He like got two of his fingers shaved off in a factory accident, which doesn't sound very pretty. So he actually couldn't play music very fast anymore. I'm like doing this like I know how to play the guitar. <laughs> can you notice? That's how you do it, right? Um, he played it slower, <laughs> and uh, which which really influenced the sound of Black Sabbath, and of course then influenced metal in the future because of that kind of slower, um, more harder sound to it. So I just find it's interesting how. Um, even bands like this, working with what they've got, um, really came up with a very distinctive sound and really pushed music into a different field. So challenges can make you into better artist, designer, or musician, and you push your work into unexpected territory, but uh, sometimes the boat capsizes and you just kind of ignore it. It's not always successful, but hopefully you learn about things along the way. So just to keep doing things that excite you, and hopefully you can bring it back into your commercial work sometimes. It's a type project I did. Um, just fun doing something kind of graphic and bold that I hadn't done before my portfolio for Hell Pink. And then some masks I've done out of cardboard. And it's totally different than my illustration work, and I felt like a kid again doing these. Here's another one that I did for a Dose art show in Toronto. So that kind of made me feel excited about doing artwork again and made me have a lot of glue gum burns on my fingers. And a big Jaguar painting that I did, which was three by three feet. Um, so that was kind of really intimidating having such a big canvas, but it worked out in the end. It was really fun. And then I don't often get to do like gooey, drenched dead birds on my illustrations. So it's kind of nice just doing it from my personal work. So things I've learned, constant evolution can be exhausting, but it's essential. But try and enjoy the struggle when you can. Remember that there are going to be those breakthrough moments that can really help you. So don't be afraid of discomfort. It can lead to good things. And in order to become an expert, you need practice. Practice, practice, practice. And it's going to be failure in between and a lot of insecurities too. And you can't always wait for creativity to strike, but if you're constantly looking at things and embedding them in yourself, then they'll be there for you just to draw on even without looking at any of them anymore. And style's not just from standing out of the crowd, it's adding your own genuine voice to the conversation. So try to be happy by what you do and not obsessed about everyone else. And just have something that you can involve with too. Because after all, sincerity and enthusiasm are infectious. So a nice quote from Ernst Haas about this, who also did commercial photography and then fine art photography and found a nice mixture of two. And this is one last slide where my husband and I got to do something that was kind of more fine art for us, but also commercial. It was really great to do a few weeks ago. Thank you.
the end. Thanks so much, guys.